One of the biggest questions within astrophysics is the question of antimatter, that mysterious substance used so often in science fiction stories, powering the warp drives of Star Trek. The idea of antimatter was first proposed by Paul Dirac in 1928, but no one had ever seen it. It was a prediction rather than a discovery, and it just seemed to some like flipping mathematical signs on numbers. But then it was subsequently experimentally proven. Dirac should be a household name up there with Einstein, but due to a rather shy nature and an avoidance of attention, he's mostly just remembered within science. The idea of antimatter is really simple. Elegantly so. The particles that make up atoms have a charge. If you flip that charge, you get an antiparticle with the same properties. One side is plus, the other minus, but that's the only difference. But what you can't do is get two particles of opposite values together, or they annihilate in a 100% conversion of matter to energy. The highest expression of Einstein's famous E equals mc squared, the most famous and recognized equation in physics. And it does it far more powerfully than the equation's applications in nuclear energy and bombs, to the tune of 143 times more than anything we can do in nuclear reactions. And we can make antimatter. It would be one of the most useful substances on Earth, but only if it was easy to make. We'd never again face any energy production problems. Fusion would pale in comparison and go obsolete. And we'd never need a Dyson Swarm, and aliens with knowledge of the universe wouldn't either. Maybe that's why we never see them. Their energy production is discrete in the form of antimatter reactors. But antimatter is one of, if not the most, expensive materials to synthesize on Earth, depending on the particle. But we can do it. There are tricks. And we can flip charges and watch the interaction on a small scale. This is particularly evident with anti-electrons, better known as positrons, that can annihilate on contact with normal matter so energetically that we can detect it easily. Indeed, we make use of this already in medicine. Yes, we have antimatter technology that already saves lives. The P in PET scan stands for positron. PET stands for positron emission tomography, where you inject a radioactive substance into someone. It decays in the body and produces positrons. They annihilate and produce gamma rays. And from that you can make a map that shows cancer, blood flow problems, coronary artery disease, etc. And it happens in nature at large scales as well. Positrons are part of our universe right now. And there are mysteries regarding them. Near the heart of the Milky Way galaxy there exists a mysterious positron antimatter fountain. And we don't know why. This is strange, but before we get into it, it's worth noting here that given that antimatter behaves identically to normal matter, there actually isn't a basic way to tell the difference between a regular star and an anti-star if it's not interacting with anything and producing gamma rays. It has been suggested that some galaxies we see could, in principle, actually be anti-galaxies that simply have no normal matter within them to annihilate with. The reason this was advanced is that the Big Bang should have produced just as much antimatter as it did regular matter, and all of it should have been annihilated and no matter should exist. There's simply no reason for the process to have had a preference that we can see, but it apparently did. So the modern consensus is that there was an unexplained asymmetry of some sort, and that there was just slightly more matter produced as opposed to antimatter. And the result after the Great Annihilation was the small amount of leftover matter that we have today and are indeed made out of. Carl Sagan once famously said we are made of star stuff, the product of nuclear reactions and stars and supernovae. But the story of what makes us up, the particles themselves, goes back to the very beginning. We are Big Bang stuff, and those protons in your body tend to the 28th power of them, started being created just three minutes after the Big Bang in the nucleosynthesis period. This generation of what would become matter would not have happened without an asymmetry of matter and antimatter production. But where that gets more complicated is that nature still produces antimatter. Near the center of the Milky Way, the antimatter fountain spews out enormous amounts of positrons, which then go out to annihilate in the interstellar medium 
to the tune of stretching 3,500 light years. And there have been several more such fountains detected since, because the matter and antimatter annihilation emits a very distinctive gamma ray signature at the energy of 511,000 electron volts. This is one of the reasons why scientists think that antimatter is fairly rare, though existent, in the universe, because that signature isn't much more prevalent, especially if anti galaxies exist. But there's no current way to tell for sure. One oddity about antimatter fountains is that they are really productive. They aren't just pouring out positrons, but on an unbelievably massive scale, beyond trillions per second. And here's the kicker. We have no idea what causes antimatter fountains. You can look for sources for them, but you see nothing. So the first place to wonder is if situations can happen with black hole accretion disks or colliding neutron stars, but nothing quite fits. It's one of those things scientists just don't have a good answer for. Even an alien technosignature wouldn't fit really well because the positrons would be a byproduct of whatever they're doing. So why wouldn't you use all the free energy from them? Whatever they might be doing, it also seems profoundly wasteful. But there are always things we don't know. For example, we have no idea what dark matter is, thus we don't know what it can do other than interact gravitationally with normal matter. Perhaps there is some mechanism, in a situational position dark matter might sit in, that can create an antimatter fountain. But the other interpretation of antimatter being that it might exist and whole galaxies might be made out of it, is interesting at least. It opens up the possibility of not only anti-planets, but anti-life, where life could arise on such a world that we could never interact with without total annihilation. Don't shake hands, and God forbid don't hug an alien or boom. But all of this does offer a far future energy supply. Harvesting massive amounts of positrons in deep space for energy production is on the table. Or weapons, a directed positron fountain weapon would certainly have an effect to the point that you probably would not want to be on a planet within the beam of a nearby positron fountain. And with no known source, what happens if they just turn on randomly, and the gamma rays created from them are extinction events? But antimatter still has another unsolved mystery. It's actually never been experimentally shown what its interaction with gravity is. It's overwhelmingly likely, based on what we know, that it should be expected to have the same interaction as normal matter. It should be attracted at the same rate. It would fall. And when it encounters normal matter, it goes boom. We could call it an anti-feather. If you drop one, it falls just like normal matter until it hits the atmosphere and then it annihilates. But we don't actually know that from experimentation. And there are some hypotheses, very old ones in fact, that it might be anti-gravity, in which case it might be subject to a repulsive force. This is unlikely, but hasn't yet been ruled out. But there is another form of matter that's in a completely different boat, and would very likely be anti-gravity and may be able to exist. It's negative mass, and would be among the most important game-changing materials we could ever come across. In a 1957 paper by Hermann Bondi, links to all papers in the description below, he details that something with negative mass should be anti-gravity. This is different from negative charge. Think of it as flipping a positive to a negative in a number. So mass and anti-mass. As we know from antimatter, the universe lets you do this sometimes. So it's more than just a mathematical exercise of exchanging opposite symbols in front of numbers. But here's the odd thing. If you have two objects of positive and negative mass, and they were equal, the negative mass would repel the other, but the positive mass would attract the other. This results in the two masses accelerating but remaining together, yet separate. Give it enough time and they will accelerate to the speed of light, relatively quickly, so long as the acceleration is constant. Assuming we can factor in all the things that might disrupt that. That's strange. If you did that with equal sized planets, you'd accelerate them to light speed or near it, causing extremely severe time dilation, meaning you could cross most, if not all, of the observable universe in a lifetime, in the frame of reference of standing and living on one of those worlds. The rest of the universe would pass by fast forward in time, however, and if you could ever stop, you'd find that massive amounts of time had passed. But what would it matter to you? Well, in our position, not much. If we were able to build a negative Earth and get this planetary star drive going, 
you just lived out your life on Earth as you normally would have. Your perception of the passage of time would remain the same in your frame of reference. If you could get rid of negative Earth and somehow slow down without destroying the planet, you'd find yourself across the universe and in the far future, all within a single lifetime. If, as it were, we were early in the game of life in the universe and rare, we might not be so rare coming out of relativistic speed. We might pop out to find a galaxy teeming with intelligent life, all discovering the same technology and sending themselves careening across the universe. Don't go too far, however. The expansion of the universe and the passage of time eventually doesn't let you do this if you want to get anywhere meaningful. But there's more. Moving to 1990 and science fiction author and physicist Robert Ford. His ideas and subsequent ones have been floated as an alternative to dark matter and dark energy. The overall structure of the universe as we see it often includes voids where very few galaxies seem to inhabit. Forward's idea was that the repulsive force of negative matter might be causing this by pushing normal matter around. The problem is you should still see evidence of the negative matter. It's unlikely to not have more interaction than just anti-gravity should it exist, and we simply don't see anything. But the strangeness doesn't end there. Negative mass as we've envisioned it is something that physics doesn't prohibit, but that doesn't mean it exists or can exist. That's not the whole story now. Indeed, the universe may be hinting at some form of negative mass. In 2017, a team at Washington State University did an experiment with atoms of rubidium, where they reduced the temperature of those atoms to near absolute zero. This is not zero degrees in how we normally think of it, but rather the coldest temperature possible at about negative 273 Celsius or negative 459 Fahrenheit. Strange things happen when you do this. What you get is known as a Bose-Einstein condensate. These conditions cause a large amount of particles to occupy the lowest quantum state to the point that quantum effects that would only normally be seen below the level of the atom suddenly become apparent at the atomic level. Using lasers, what happened with the rubidium atoms is that they began to show traits of having achieved some sort of negative mass when they accelerated towards a pushing force instead of being repelled by it. Other oddities in this grain is that under certain conditions, electrons can do something like this. And there's even a hypothesis of some unknown semiconductor composites that might exhibit signs of negative mass in some form. If that's the case, then it may ultimately hint that the universe does indeed allow for negative mass and even create it in nature. This changes everything we know, however, about the universe and create some huge headaches along with it for the physicists. The reason is that if you could have negative mass, a bunch of highly speculative technologies come on the table. Think backwards time travel, Alcubierre warp drives, and stable wormholes. And that's a problem. If time travel and wormholes were truly possible, and we see hints of materials that could make them possible, then we have to ask a question. Where are the aliens and time travelers and various mixes of both? One explanation is that our understanding of physics is incomplete, thus we don't yet know about any other potential brick walls that may prevent those things. Or it could be so unbelievably difficult and resource intensive, no one ever does it across the entire timeline of the far future universe. But there is another option and it's spooky. It could simply be that there is and never will be anyone else out there. And in the future, perhaps the not too distant one, we are no longer there to develop the technology. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently contemplating the end of my YouTube career centuries from now. Think of the headline in the Daily Intergalactic Times, Jam G finally found alien life, and then promptly hugged the antimatter alien. And then he was no more. But the larger mass regenerative alien soon recovered. Not good for me. Though I'm glad the alien is okay, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.